Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, just before I start, I want to apologise for our principal, uh, Ruth Musker, who was hoping to be here today, um, but uh, couldn't join us. Uh, my name's Paula Hasey. I'm the Deputy Principal at Murray Bridge High School and have uh, oversight of our Seven to High School program. Joined today by Kiralee Martin, who's our Middle Years Assistant Principal, and Jared Daly, who's one of our Middle Years Student Pathways Leader, and he has particular focus on school culture. Uh, I just want to, before we get into sort of talking about where we're where at in our thinking, um, I want to acknowledge uh, SASPA and the ongoing support, and you'll see some stuff in here that we've picked up from the work of SASPA in the past, which has been really helpful, and for the pilot schools as well, particularly Wirianda, who um, we've been to a couple of their open days and have been able to gain a lot of insights into what we could do with a similar context and cohort of students, so thank you very much. Our context. Uh, to begin with, and listening to Craigmore, similar context, regional location. Uh, we've got a range of different things going on. Our big number one focus is on opportunity for everyone across our context. So we want to be able to have stu students who want to be able to achieve at their highest academic ability, um, right through to supporting students who may have had some really serious interruptions to their learning. We're about uh, 1,100 students at the moment, um, transitioning 400 students next year, so 200 plus year sevens. Uh, we're an entrepreneurial specialist school and regional music focus school, um, which services the Murraylands area. We're a, a Google reference school and we've done a lot of work around digital equity and trying to make sure that every student has access to digital learning in every classroom. We have an independent learning centre which is off-site, about 110 um, enrolments. Uh, special options classes, we have an inclusive education centre and a couple of special classes that we also run and we're thinking about next year how we can manage a school-based third special class to be able to manage students who are really profoundly behind in their learning and how we can support teachers to do that in mainstream. It's a real challenge for us and interested to hear today what other schools might be doing in that area. Uh, in our school, in our partnership, we are the, the largest um, secondary school by far. There's another community school that's in our partnership. 95% of uh, the public primary school enrolments come to Murray Bridge High School. So that's been a real opportunity for us to be able to build um, in lots of areas and particularly in continuity of literacy and numeracy learning. So that's been a bit of a focus of ours that I want to talk through today. As I mentioned, opportunity for all. Uh, we certainly see students across a full range of literacy and numeracy, students who have barely have single word recognition, right up to students that have you know, clearly been you know, very fluent readers since before they started primary school. Uh, our, achieve, our focus is always on how can we help continue pushing students' growth towards the SEA, noting that sometimes we might not meet it, in fact, pretty regularly, but that growth for every single learner is what we're after. So that is a central part of our work, as it is for all of us. Uh, we have Aboriginal learners, about 13% of our enrolment Aboriginal students. Um, we have 20 children in care uh, currently with us. We have a variable EALD uh, cohort. At the moment, our primary EALD enrolment is our Filipino students, um, but it changes significantly. Um, about five, six, seven years ago, we had a large uh, Chinese student enrolment was associated with local industries. We're expecting that to increase again soon. Also, we are a Category 2 school, um, coming from fairly serious social inherent disadvantage in our community. So students' literacy levels they bring from home continue to be uh, the challenge for us, but how we can support kids to be able to um, think about their lives in a different way is a central part of our work. And as it is, I know, for many schools, it's our parent caregiver engagement is an ongoing challenge. How do we help our community, our families, um, to be able to help their students. And uh, what we often hear from families is that oh, they don't know how to do it either when we call home. So that's a real challenge. And also working with our Aboriginal families in particular, um, who have come, you know, only a generation ago from uh, places uh, such as down at Raukum, which is near our school, where education was so far away from their um, access to community and society that there's still that sense of how education is um, valued for families and how we engage families in ongoing challenges, I know it is for all of us. So 400 students we're looking at next year, the 200 year sevens that are coming. No green button. 
That one. Today, we want to um, talk with you around the central theme for education, for our, for our transition, sorry, which comes really back from the fact that we have a uh, partnership where the vast majority of students come to us. Um, we have seven uh, public feeder primary schools, and that is around continuity. How do we support continuity of learning, uh, continuity of inclusion, continuity of engagement for students, and that has some challenges with it as well for us, and our continuity of culture too, that students are familiar with in primary school. So a lot of our work over the last uh, two years has been working really closely with our feeder schools around what students are experiencing right now, how can we reduce that metacognitive load when they're coming into a new environment already that they feel familiar and comfortable. And that, of course, applies for all students, but particularly for vulnerable learners, because we do see a significant drop-off, particularly in Year 9, uh, with attendance. How can we help every student to feel like they belong and can access the curriculum that's here, making sure we get that transition right um, across these four areas? And that's what we'll be discussing today uh, with Kira Lee Jarrett and myself. Continue of learning. Um, we have did some work uh, last year, it was supported by the, uh, the Department's Continuity of Learning Project around uh, work with a number of our primary schools, focusing in on two key areas. The primary school principals um, spent some time talking about school improvement plan alignment. Each school has their school improvement plan, of course. There was very little alignment between our school improvement plans, and particularly with our primary schools focusing pretty heavily on early years literacy, and we, we were focused in on the kind of middle area transition into SACE literacy. Thought, what are we doing about middle, learn, middle years, these foundational fundamental years for the students' trans, um, transfer? So we spent some time um, working with partnership primary schools around what their um, SIP alignment priorities were, and out of that came to a shared agreement around continuity of learning in the middle years and what that would look like for us as a school. Uh, there's been partnership professional learning groups that are associated with that. Once a term, um, all partnerships, uh, teachers get together, and we have a middle years literacy and numeracy continuity group, which a lot of work um, on the ground is driven out of. Last year, we also engaged in a, in, in a work shadowing project, and I'll discuss that a little further. Other bits and pieces we've been working on are things like learning structures, how can we can get the day right for, for kids, how can we get the right mix of teachers. I'll just give you a bit of an overview of that, and our um, work in digital learning, particularly digi digital equity, which has been a focus for us. I'm going to jump forward five slides at once here, I think. There we are. So, I mentioned the uh, work we did with um, our partnership principals, uh, which also extended to a second part of that, which is a work shadowing project that we ran with our primary school and middle years teachers at secondary school. Our objective was that we'd have common approaches to align teacher practices. Um, in literacy and numeracy, and that was one of the um, objectives out of the department's continuity of learning project, which we found to be really, really helpful for where we were at. So I acknowledge the support there. And we broke that into two groups. Uh, the, the things I mentioned about aligning improvement priorities, um, but a very large piece of this work, which was the most insightful thing that we've done, and in hindsight seemed like a, a, a no-brainer, was the reciprocal work shadowing that we carried out between Year 5, 6 and 7 teachers at our primary schools and our uh, 8 and 9 teachers at the high school. We had up uh, 30 days in the end of reciprocal work shadowing. We had um, teachers worked in teams. We run a STEM and Global Perspectives, Hass English, Science, Maths, uh, Digital Tech model of paired teachers. They would spend some time at primary schools. Those primary school teachers would come back and spend time um, at the high school was ex exposed so many areas for uh, connection, so much alignment, areas where we knew we could do a better job, and we've got some outcomes out of that. The underpinning, so there's lots of ongoing work in terms of supporting literacy and numeracy. The biggest cultural thing that came out of it was a recognition from primary school teachers, and they said to us many times that, oh, you, you care for the kids as much as us. And, yeah, I know, it sounds... And, and for, as a... As a you know, I've only ever taught in secondary school, so I was like, of course we do. 
but it drove immediately the conversation because we also had the conscious of you know we're not going to tell we don't tell you guys how to do your job with kids you know you're much more much more efficient much more fluent and successful at teaching literacy and numeracy uh, core skills than we are of course but it was immediately the dialogue was open to say let us know what you do so we can help prepare kids better help them prepare to have their best and that was just uh, such an <laughs> insightful moment and became really this shared agreement and the positivity that's come out of that connection about how much we all care about each of our individual Murraylands learners has been um, really, really important. And of course that's a partnership all the time, but at the teacher to teacher level was a really important bit um, outcome for this. What it's meant in terms of our uh, work for supporting continuity of learning is we've developed a re reciprocal planning model um, really focusing on core skills. We've done a lot of curriculum mapping at Murray Bridge High School around making sure that kids have the core skills for, to be able to move forward. Uh, we wanted to be able to feed that back towards the primary school, so some backwards planning of non-negotiable skills, but then the forwards planning, particularly vocabulary for learning and vocabulary in particular subjects, to be able to support that metacognitive transition. Uh, an example, it seems really basic, but even things like bod mass, bid mass, bed mass, we all agreed to do bid mass. Because for lots of kids, that's a, I don't know what you're talking about, year eight maths teacher, then we'll start to fall off really quickly. So um, it's both at a strategic planning level, but also really at a basic classroom level too. And we continue to run a um, partnership professional learning group, um, as I mentioned before. Now I've got a little video here of, um, from some kids and some teachers who've been doing some of this work from our primary schools. So I'm not sure how to run this video from here. There we go. Thank you vocabulary with the high school so for example when we did a genre like exposition instead of using language features we use stylistic features so that way when our students go to high school that's one less thing that they need to learn. The learning experiences um, have made me feel more comfortable because we're using some of the things that the high school do and then it like helps me know that I won't um, like it'll be easier for me. For example, like with our writing, we've been using like the same language, like the stylistic fe features. The most significant <laughs> change would have to be our rubrics. Um, Kiralee showed us a way of numbering the achievement standard, breaking down the sentences, and then when we go to do a task, for example, an exposition again, because that's topical for me at the moment, um, I choose no more than three of those um, achievement standards and then I can make a differentiated rubric for the kids. I found that my students loved it because I wasn't focusing on every aspect of an exposition. I was focusing on things like the stylistic features and the till paragraphs, which is another thing we have aligned with the high school. Mm. Um, we've done the same in my class across narratives. Um, yeah, choosing three main points from the achievement standard to assess and focus on while they're doing their narratives helps the kids to tick off whether they're at um, proficient, extending or mastery across different levels, particularly with their stylistic features using metaphors and alliteration and stuff within their narrative. So they can actually go, I've used this many, which would put me at the mastery levels so that'll boost my grade. And the fact that they can actually see that rather than make a judgment call, especially in English, um, they're really loving that. Our students know exactly what they need to do, mm. they know exactly how to get there and they know exactly how to move forward. Yeah. They also love that we say the high school do this yeah. and yeah, so that they think that's pretty cool. It makes them feel more comfortable mm. knowing that what they're learning and being taught and the language we use in the classroom is going to be familiar for them next year. Um, I think one thing that will make learning easier at the high school is having Google Classroom because we use it here at our school and it'll be easier because they use it at the high school as well. There's a little bit more on there. That was it? Oh, yeah. I'll whip through some things about learning structures and I'm sure we'll be able to share these um, slides with you later as well. We've done some workshops, yep, we're talking about with primary schools about what students are uh, bringing, how do we get the structures right? So we talked a lot about different timetable structures, we talked a lot about additional literacy and numeracy, knowing that many of our students are coming in, um, majority really, um, at least half our students are uh, at or below the SEA. How can we support them? So we've built an additional literacy and numeracy lesson for seven and eights. We've got shorter blocks of uh, lesson times in the morning. Uh, we've 
putting some additional literacy and numeracy has meant we've had sort of cut some time out of now a curriculum for our elective rotation type subjects, but rather than those teachers becoming part of a relief rotation or something along those lines, we want to use those teachers to be able to provide either in-class literacy and numeracy support for students um, targeted within the classroom, and a similar way as Craig Moore talked about, um, not moving away from a model of using class support uh, SSOs, or alternatively for some contextual learning. So a model may be a STEM class is wanting to do some design, let's get the tech teacher in there to help some kids with some like, actual practical applications, which is pretty tough when you've got 30 kids in the class and you're trying to, every student's got a different thing they want to do. So how can we use the skills of our teachers to be able to build better relationships and build some stronger cross curricular opportunities and support targeted teacher-led literacy and numeracy intervention? Uh, we'll have um, student-centred teacher teams so uh, there are subject teacher pairings, so for year seven teachers will have the students for two or three of their classes, similarly in year eight in the sort of core Australian curriculum learning areas. At the moment our school's typically broken up, even though there's lots of building works underway, so people are getting moved all the time, but that teacher offers a largely faculty learning area base, definitely moving into um, having a student-based um, office space, and that's facilitated by a very large building project we've got at the moment. So we are building a uh, dedicated uh, building four, sevens and eights, and Jared will talk through that a little bit more. Uh, one thing I did just want to touch on before I um, hand over to Kira Lee to talk some more about our transition program is digital learning tools and digital equity. For a long time, we've tried lots of different ways um, to get the BYD program right. Uh, we're subsidising um, devices for families to buy, still only got to 50%. And we thought, right, let's just be done with that altogether. We provide a Chromebook to every student at our school. It's a low cost device, but have, we have a, no issues with durability. Students can use it right through to year 12. And um, every student when they enrol is, is given one of these, same as they would a library book, to be able to borrow and use. That's had a really profound impact for the way our teachers have been able to go about changing things for students uh, in the classroom. There's no more excuses, even students who were bringing were very small. We still provide BYOD for families who want to bring in a device, but there's less than 5% of um, families use that now because we provide this device to students. People have said to us, how do you afford that? We pay for half of it with a reduction in printing cost, um, first up. <laughs> and the other half in the salary of our finance SSO, who was managing our, um, our sort of borrow loan program that we had in the past. So it's become essentially uh, self-funding, really. That's something we, um, we're pretty proud of, is to be able to really remove what has been a significant barrier for learning and, and teacher planning preparation at our school. Just a quick look at our timetable model, we'll share this later, but we have we talked a lot about block timetables and thought for our cohort and consultation with our staff and with our kids that they wanted to be able to see teachers more than a couple of times a week. That mattered a lot and that was the most dominant thing that our kids told us. So, um, and this is a model, obviously, is a, a lot more in a complex school. I'll hand across to um, Kira Lee, who's going to talk about continuity of engagement and our transition program. Thank you. Um, transition is something that we haven't got 100% right in the past. I'm sure that um, all of you are looking at ways to improve your transition programs and, and for us, oh gosh, right. um, definitely the last couple of years have been a lot of trial and error. So today I'm just going to draw your attention to some of the things that we've um, worked toward fixing in the past and some of the things that we're really excited about implementing this year. We have informal sessions. We go out to our primary schools. As Paula said, we're really lucky because we have seven major feeder primary schools. So we go and visit them and have an informal chat to parents, caregivers and students. This year they were hugely well attended and I think that the basis of that is that parents are very anxious about their students coming and the, and the kids were really, really nervous. You hear a little bit about from our kids later who attended these evenings and how just having that chat, seeing some familiar faces, hearing about our programs, we saw a lot of students move from terrified, which was one of the <laughs> adjectives we heard, terrified to come to high school, to feeling a lot more comfortable at the end of that. Um, we're really excited to be including parent caregiver conferences this year in term two and term three. So we're doing an online booking system, trying to get every 
parent and caregiver of all of our students, be 400 interviews potentially, um, to come in and, and have a chat with us. And obviously doing a lot of work with the primary schools as well, chatting to those primary school teachers. Again, we're in a really good spot for that given our um, feeder primary schools and the work that we've already been doing with them. Um, in additional ATSI student and family visits and transition and we've included a vulnerable learner visit where we're going to, uh, we'll hear about the neighbourhoods from Jared a little bit later, but vulnerable learners will come in small groups, meet their neighbourhood leader as an extra transition and they'll begin creating their learning and engagement action plans which we're going to implement for our vulnerable learners next year. Data gathering has been a very big challenge for us um, in the past with transition and we're looking at doubling that challenge next year and this year. We've got literacy and numeracy data, behaviour data, attendance data, and all of these things that we're bringing out of the department database, but also all of the data that we gather from our parent caregiver interviews, our interviews with students and our interviews with primary school teachers. In the past we have found that some of this information gets lost. We weren't consistent in the way that we were asking questions and we weren't consistent in the way that we were sharing this information with our staff once we'd gathered it. We had Assettos going out and working with our Aboriginal students and then they had a wealth of knowledge around these students that sometimes was not then shared in the way that it needed to be. So we have created, we're a Google school as we said, and we've created a transition record for every student. So using Google Forms, we've come up with this transition record. When you log into the Google Form, you identify whether you're um, interviewing the primary school teacher, the parent caregiver or other supports providers or the student and it will then link you to a series of agreed upon questions that we have created as a transition team. For example, this is what our primary teacher information form looks like. So we look at gathering literacy skills, the progress and needs, um, areas of strength, learning growth points. They're similar questions for that we'll have with um, parents and caregivers. What are their growth points? What are their needs? How do we engage your child? things like that, um, but it's consistent. And I think that was the real message for us is now when we're, ha it doesn't matter who's leading the parent conference, we're asking the same questions, we're gathering the same information. And then most excitingly for us, it will somehow, <laughs> I have no idea about the backward planning of this, Paul is the person to ask, but it will then draw all of that information together and we will have something that we're able to consistently share with our staff that puts all of that data into one place. So this is the most exciting element of our transition program, I think, because um, we're going to be consistent, we're going to know our students before they get to us, and it's not going to be one or two people that really know each student well, it's going to be that information is shared across our whole site. Um, I'm going to pass on to Paul Logan. Uh, thanks. As Kirillia mentioned, there's some things in the past we know we haven't done as well as we want to do. And one of those has been the, for some groups of students we haven't done as good a job to, about supporting their transition. And there's been finding the balance of having a collaborative team to be there to support or a large school. How can we have the collaborative team, but how can we also have someone who's got that kid? Because that's um, often, I mean, duplication is inefficient, but it is, the only thing worse than that, of course, is that students fall through the crack and go goes under the radar. So we've been very, very intentional the last couple of years of trying out different things to be able to get that balance right and we've had some successes in areas particularly with Aboriginal learners and the other things we now want to expand out and use that model across our school. Um, another part of for inclusion that is um, a challenge for us is how we ensure continuity 
um, but also expectation management for um, students and how they've been supported at primary schools. I know some of our primary schools sort of run bridging classes for students with low literacy and numeracy. Uh, some students have been at bridging class since year two now, so they'll be transitioning to mainstream. How do we support them to do that? Students that may have been on part-time programs, how do we support that? So there's lots of different work going on with individual students in primary schools about supporting that ongoing engagement. And also how we um, deal with the challenge of students um, and increasing levels of anxiety for coming to school at all. So the attendance, families definitely doing everything they can to get the student to school, finding it hard to get the kids out of bed. So that's the, another area of challenge um, for us, as I know it is for all of us. So um, as a, a bit of a summary, of the current sort of work we have um, to be able to support particularly um, vulnerable learners coming into school in addition to the learning supports and the transition supports um, that we've set out is working in these dedicated collaborative teams um, but with some individual ownership. So the model for us um, at the moment that we're having some success is, is our, our alert team, the Aboriginal Learner and Education Response Team. Uh, that's our, our AETs, our Diversity Inclusion AP um, heads that team up with our three Assettos and um, Aboriginal Student Mentors. They meet every week for um, a couple of hours and work through individual student learner profiles. How are students going? They get group, small groups of teachers in, speak to them about individual students, uh, co-write student one plans, review student data on a cyclical basis um, with a bit of triage as well for students who are um, more Aboriginal learners that might be in more of a crisis point in their learning. That's a model we want to roll out. A central part of that model is each person in the team has a group of students assigned to them. So we're working together as a group, all aware of what's happening for each learner, but there is that individual accountability. So that's certainly something that we want to continue to expand into our students with learning difficulties and learning disabilities. Lots of students we have aren't verified disability, no IACP funding support, but uh, certainly have some learning difficulties. Um, a challenge of how we go about su supporting them and how we can use that alert model. Um, we do have a model where our special options students are engaged in a number of mainstream learning opportunities as well. That's been really important for us and really important for inclusion around other students understanding um, the students and special options, them being out and about together during the day, but also for our teachers to understand special options education too and some skills that they can use back into mainstream classrooms. So that's been something being really successful we want to expand. Hobo being these students, um, as I know you all do, we have a number of students that have some really serious well-being um, needs, um, serious mental health um, issues that they are working through. We've uh, set up a high-risk um, profiles uh, system where students work with our well-being leaders and our ment uh, well-being mentors to develop a, essentially a high-risk profile and work and what works individually for them. And then they meet with small groups of teachers of those students to say, yes, this is the strategy for this student. And they're updated regularly and work closely uh, with families and with um, agencies as well. Uh, we have a systematic referral process for students to be able to self-identify and refer for seek, uh, seek, seek support as well through a student uh, centre wellbeing hub. Behaviours, we have some students that have some um, pretty chronic, uh, serious behaviours that impact their learning, impact other people's learning. Um, there are some students that receive some funding support for that as ICP funding. There are plenty of students that don't, of course. So we use a, another team-based ba team approach there with a mix of mentors and it's very much about lining up the best adult to be able to work with the child. So it's not to say we've got this person who's available for 20 hours a week, you must work with that person. That doesn't always work, as we know. So we use a team approach there again to say who can be the best mentor for you. And it may be um, SSO mentoring support. It may be a student pathways leader or wellbeing leader. It may be a teacher. And we acknowledge and, um, and potentially release teachers to be able to provide that support as needed. Um, we have uh, Better Behaviour Centre, EDGE on site as well. And we work really closely with them and spent the last few years building a really strong, close relationship with that group. And they provide quite a lot of support to us, including support through transition. Attendance, absolutely, is a... As, um, as uh, Craig was mentioning this morning and some other people asking questions... Very big problem for us as well, definitely in the 75% on a good day. Uh, how do we, and that the impact of that, of course, on continuity of learning for students um, is significant. We have also have a dedicated SSO2 who provides um, outgoing outreach support for students. An area where 
sort of in the moment is how do, what, what do we do for that group of students whose families really, really want their kids to be coming to school, they're pushing really hard, but the students are finding just coming to school is just too much of a, a bridge, the fact just stepping out of the house and into school. What do we do to support those middle years learners? That's a challenge for us and we're thinking about different ways we can um, support them. And also uh, thinking about engaging social work support too, uh, to be able to support families um, with uh, getting kids uh, to school. We have an independent learning centre which is off site. Uh, typically students are 16 when they enrol down there. We're also uh, thinking about different ways we can transition students um, a bit earlier to independent learning centre, knowing that many of our students who would never have finished school um, go on to have success. And our centre's up to, I think it's about 130 SACE completers at the end of last year. So that's been a successful program for us. How do we expand that? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, digital equity has been an important thing for us. Also a uniform fund that we run to make sure every student feels like you know, they can belong. So they're the, some of the things that we're doing around supporting individual learners. Absolutely that collaborative team approach um, is the centre of our work. I'll hand over to Jared, who is um, one of our Student Pathways leaders for middle years, and he'll talk you through the work we've been doing around school culture. I think we've uh, almost used our half an hour up, so I'll try and be uh, pretty quick. Um, so, 2020, uh, our exec team discussed a number of things that we wanted to improve as a site for 2021 and moving into the future. Um, we, in this year, we've placed a high priority on improving our school climate and culture, our expert teaching, uh, our literacy and numeracy growth, as well as our uh, supporting our Aboriginal learners. Um, so we surveyed both our students and the staff around our school climate and culture, and as a result, we've come up with a number of shared agreements. Uh, these shared agreements have allowed us, uh, staff and students, to have greater clarity of what is expected of them and allows consistent expectations from both our staff and our students. Uh, we've also um, employed an additional ASETO this year um, to support with transition um, and the large number of Indigenous students coming across next year. Uh, a couple of the posters that we've used, so again, by having these in all of our classrooms, helps our uh, students and staff refer to the charts and make sure we have a consistent approach for all. Uh, neighbourhoods, this is probably what I'm most excited about and this is probably our biggest change um, for next year. So we've come up with neighbourhoods rather than a house system, uh, a couple of reasons for that. So our neighbourhood names were chosen in consultation with our local Nurunjeri community uh, who identified these names as important totems in the community. Uh, so we've got Kungari, which is the black swans, uh, Nori, the pelican, Pondi, the Murray cod, and Wirakudi is a frill neck lizard. Uh, each one of these neighbourhoods has a B1 student pathways leader who oversees approximately 150 students, where previously we had a year level leader who would oversee 200 to 250 students. Um, the neighbourhood's made up of two year seven classes, two year eight classes, and two year nine classes. Um, so how the structure sort of works, um, part of the change was obviously, like I just said, getting rid of year level leaders and moving to specific um, middle school uh, neighbourhood leaders. Um, it sort of allows us as a neighbourhood leader to create deeper, more effective uh, connections and relationships with students and their families, because uh, we're not only working with them for one year, we get to work with those uh, students and their families for three years. Um, it's part of our commitment to improve our school culture that we uh, introduce these neighbourhoods. Um, and in 2022, we'll run uh, all these neighbourhoods from 7 to 12. They'll take over from our previous sport house system. Uh, as a school, we found that the students weren't identifying with their houses and we only used the system for sports day. Uh, in 2021 and the future, the neighbourhood system is used for other activities such as neighbourhood camps, success days, success and growth assemblies, critical and creating thinking days, as well as neighbourhood activities and then obviously sports day as well. So it's not just sort of uh, structured around sports day. Um, we've also sort of changed our, our class names, as you can see there. So currently we sort of have, uh, it might be 8R, 8G, stuff like that. So next year they'll align with the neighbourhoods. Um, 
Part of the reason we've done this is in our new build, which you can see here. This is upstairs in our new build. Uh, all our new Year 7s and Year 8s will be housed in this upstairs area. So as you can see, I'm the Kungari leader. So down there in the blue, I've picked my four classrooms. So I'll have two Year 7 classes and two Year 8 classes. Uh, Wirrakuti will have four classes blocked together, same with Pondi, same with Nori. Um, and then our year nines are probably going to take over what we currently call M block. So we'll sort of have more of a, a middle school hub and then a separate senior school hub. A um, couple of reasons for that is the, we wanted the year sevens and eights to feel like they sort of own an area a little bit, feel comfortable in the school. They're the only, you know, they'll be the 400 students using that space. There won't be any year nines, tens, elevens and twelves, so they won't be overwhelmed by uh, the older people and the older students uh, being in their space. Um, we're also going to use this next year as a space that majority of their lessons um, will be in these classrooms. So currently we don't use lockers, but next year all year sevens and eights will have to use lockers. Um, so they'll be in here for about five lines, so uh, maths, science, PE, HASS and English. Um, and that way they can have that, they can own that space and in their neighbourhoods they can own that space as well. A couple of other things that we're introducing just quickly uh, is rewards and recognition for our students uh, to help improve our school culture and climate. Um, we've included a number of inclusive programs which run at break times or after school. Most of these are run by staff members. A few examples, a robotics club, a chess club, volleyball club, rugby club, uh, music bands and choirs, as well as others. Um, we've also tried to include some uh, success days um, and other activities. We also have Murray Bridge High, so we want to reward our students for positive behaviours, uh, so they can be rewarded for community awards, so using initiative to support others, personal growth, improve, uh, improving their learning and engagement, extra, extracurricular activities, so those after school lunchtime programs that we just talked about, as well as leadership, so um, using initiative to lead action. Uh, we also hold success and growth assemblies in our neighbourhoods about every three weeks to recognise positive behaviours and achievements that happen in that time. I'll just lastly, oh, we'll skip the video here, um, but in 2020 we went through a rebranding process, uh, so we now have a new school logo, a new school motto and these brand new facilities which will be ready at the end of this year, as well as the double transition. As a school, this has allowed us to make a number of positive changes which improve, hopefully, the educational experience and outcomes for our students and their families. And then lastly, how'd you get this working, Paul? Last video, this is from some of our students that are coming to join us. Um, I'm most excited about making new friends, meeting new people and having more learning opportunities. I'm excited about having different subject choices and being able to do like um, agriculture and home ec and all those kinds of things because it's something different from what we've been able to do at, at primary school. My biggest concern is what people like, how people like, what people think of me and like the like people from other schools because like they're probably not used to all the new people as well. So. Um, my biggest concern is probably how big the school is and the age gap between like the year eights and the year twelves. My biggest concern about coming to high school is fitting in with other friendship groups and making different friends because I've been in the same classes for all of primary school and making that transition to a lot more people can be difficult. Um, I think the new building for sevens and eights will be good because we'll get to have yeah, collaborate with other people and get to know certain people and our teachers and stuff. Especially when you're first starting, they can you can be like intimidated and stuff, but having it so it's separate and just for middle schoolers makes it a lot easier and more less nerve-wracking and more comfortable. I'm excited about the new building and that all of our classes are in the same building. They're not all spread out throughout the school and we have the same teachers for most subjects. The neighbourhood's a, a good idea because get to um, get to know the people in your class and your teachers really well so you um, form great connections and stuff with them.